With that, go to 1 Corinthians 15.7. That's the launching point. It was a launching point for the first message. It's a launching point now for the second message. We're going to take a look at James the Unbeliever. We're going to take a look at now in this message, James, the person he was. With the little information that we have, in the Gospels about James and his family, including Mary. Including Mary. I am convinced through all the sources that after the death of Joseph, the father, and these brothers and sisters were responsible for the household that Mary lived in, and they made sure that she was taken care of and Christ. And probably also Joseph of Marathia, which some think that was his uncle. And he traveled to different places with him. So there was a big support group there. They didn't necessarily believe, though, that Jesus was the Son of God. In fact, they didn't believe it. Even to a point, I believe in Jesus' early ministry years, the first year or so, Mary is not convinced. Out of all people, she should have been. And I'll show you why. But the thing is, the focus is on James right now because we're doing a study in the book of James. But James was an unbeliever. He was a Nazarite. Probably a Nazarite with a commitment for so many years because you could do days, months, weeks, years, according to number six in the Old Testament. You could have been a man or a woman. You were separated for the service of the Lord and what you could provide, depending on the sex gender, in that service. And James was a Nazarite. Some believe he was a Nazarite for life. I'm not going to argue with that. No one's going to know for sure. But that means he was separated probably didn't even know it was but not by choice. But he was going to be separated with the background and credentials if you listen to my first message that would give him access to areas that normally the apostles or any other disciples could not enter into to preach to the highest appointed areas in the religious world there in Jerusalem. For instance, like I said before, the temple and the synagogues. But Jesus chose them. There's some sources, actually several different sources, that claim that after the resurrection, one of the disciples actually of Jesus told James before James was confronted by Jesus himself here in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Some sources actually state that James still would not believe, almost like a doubting Thomas, and who would not believe unless he could sup and, and drink from the cup with Jesus that he was resurrected. And only then he would believe that he was the son of God. Well, he got what he wished for. And he saw, I believe, that's why I think James was somewhere close, if not there, at the crucifixion, seeing Jesus actually die. Maybe even assisting in the burial, placing that tomb, placing Christ in that tomb. And then, he would not believe after the resurrection until he saw with his own eyes, he actually, according to these resources, drank from this cup in other words, a face-to-face -face meeting with Christ to actually see for his, with his own eyes that he is risen and he is alive. And that's what I believe happened in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. It's been the launching point. We start at 1 Corinthians 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. 
After that, he was seen of James, then all of the apostles. And then Paul says, and last of all, he was seen of me also. And in our last message, I kept asking the question, why James? What was so special about James? He was an unbeliever. He didn't believe. He didn't faith in Christ. He did not even pretend. We have no record of him even pretending to believe that his half-brother was the Son of God, the Savior. I mean, you see from one place to another place in Scripture that he rejects it. He rejects the notion that Christ was the Savior. You first go to Matthew 13. Go there with me now. Matthew 13, verse 50, I think it's 55. I'll just start with 53. This is where Jesus rejected at Nazareth. Verse 15. There's a parallel passage in Mark 6. But let's read both tonight. And it came to pass, and also in Luke, by the way. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. <clears throat> and when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence has, with hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren? His brethren, remember that, his brethren, James, Iosis, and Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence they have this man all these things. And they were offended in him. Literally, displeased, not acknowledging his authority. Whose authority? Christ's authority. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country, in his own house. And he did not, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Apistus there. Because of their lack of faith, actually no faith at all, in Christ's authority and what he was teaching them. Who? Who? We go to Mark and we read the same thing that I just read to you. And that's a parallel passage. Let's read it. Let's go through all of it. So there's no doubt in your mind. Mark 6. And verse 1. And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. Here it says the disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished. They were amazed what they were hearing, saying, For whence has this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and the rest of the brothers, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Same language is being there, being used there. They distrusted him, and they did not want any, they didn't want to receive any part of his authority that he was claiming about himself. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin. Sort of that word kin there. And in his own house. Mark gives us a clearer picture. The town folk rejected him that knew Jesus. That's a carpenter's son. What the heck is he saying? Listen to this guy. And how the heck does he think he's going to do these mighty works? Obviously there's not many being done there. Why? Because of their apistis. But Mark gives us a different picture here also because he adds something. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin. Who's his kin? Mary, James, Oasis, and Judah, and Simon. And he could, and he could there do no mighty work save that he laid his hand on a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled. It even astonished Jesus. That his own countrymen, the people he grew up around, 
and his own family. Brothers, sisters, and mother, in this case, didn't have no faith in him at all. Now, I can understand maybe why his brothers didn't. Those of you who have brothers probably wonder, what the heck, did I come out of the same womb that he did? I'm so different. I have different opinions, different views. My lifestyle is different. How in the heck did I come out of that same womb? I'm sure some of you brothers, especially when you fight with each other, wonder those things on occasion, wonder about those things on occasion. Jesus marveled. He was astonished at their odd peace to stare again once again. And he went around about the villages teaching. Here we have a rejection of his own countrymen and his own kin. You'll see the same story in Luke. So what does that tell you? They're unbelievers. At this point, at the beginning period of Jesus' ministry, three and a half year ministry, they were not believers. They were not fathers of Christ's message. For the most part, they didn't want nothing to do with it. Go to Luke. We see, starting with verse 16, Jesus' rejection at Nazareth. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his customs was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for the, to read. And Luke gives us an added picture to this whole story. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and be covering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable, acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book at that point. And there's prophetic reasons why he closed it at that point. But that's not the subject matter tonight. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Fastened on him. Because he was proclaiming some heavy stuff. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken heart, to preach deliverance to the captives, to recover the recovering of the sight to the blind, to set the liberty them that are bruised. That's some heavy stuff. You're walking in, you open up to Isaiah, and whoa! And you stop halfway through that latter part of that scripture. Heavy stuff. I would be astonished too. I would marvel too. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And they began to say unto themselves, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And, and began to say unto them, This day in this scripture fulfilled in your ears. In other words, I am he who the prophets proclaim would come. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Literally, the words of grace that proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? Is not this the carpenter's son? Luke gives us a little different flavor on the story. And he said unto them, ye will surely say unto me this proverb. Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do not also hear in this country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when the great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Serapetta of the city of Sodom, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elijah the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Nazareth, saving Naaman the Syrian, the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they had heard these things, were filled with wrath. Literally in the Greek, boiling over with the intent to kill Jesus. With the intent to kill Jesus. Just imagine if your half-brother went around saying the things that Jesus said 
in town. Oh, no, I can't believe he's saying that again. I can't believe that he's putting us all on the, in the limelight. Doesn't he know what he says also is going to affect us? Doesn't he know that when he opens his mouth, what comes out of his mouth is going to affect us also? This was what this kid was thinking, amongst other things, other thoughts. They were being exposed through Jesus' mouth as some nuts that happened to live amongst the civilized, sane people. They disliked Jesus for it. If anything, they grew bitter, his own kin, because of not only his actions, but his words. They didn't see him and recognize him as Savior. They didn't see him as the only begotten Son of the Lord. They came down here to rescue us from our miserable destiny if he didn't. They saw him as an, an agitator, a fool, someone that didn't make any sense at all. In a sense, just like Jacob's sons looked at Joseph, Joseph being a type of Christ, what the heck is he saying? What the heck is he dreaming about now? Why does our father love him so much? More than he loves us. Makes him coats of many colors. Shows him favor. What in the heck is going on here? And why do we have to be part of this insanity? And I'm making the point. These brothers, sisters, and mother up up to this time, were agitated at him. To them, he was nothing more than a troublemaker that brought attention to the whole family. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. They were boiling up with the intention to kill him, and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill. Literally, the edge of the hill was a cliffside. Their intention was to throw him over and get rid of Jesus. Commit murder. Led him unto the edge of the hill whereupon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. But what happened? But he passing through the midst of them went his way. This is the first recorded history of an invisible man. Think about it. They make movies about an invisible man. I'm showing you one right now. In Scripture, Christ became the invisible man. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. In the mob that were leading him to the edge of the cliffside to throw him over to kill him, he slips away. Not one person saw him slip away. Think about it in this mob. This is truly the first invisible man. This is truly a miracle that most people don't see as a miracle. And he slips away. That's Luke's account. With Matthew and Mark, we have an account of Joseph's brothers and sisters and mother, his next of kin, that were agitated at him also because of the message. Because of the message. The people of Jesus' hometown rejected him. Period. Now, James was part of that hometown crowd, but he also was his half-brother. He was his kin. James was an unbeliever. His family was offended by Jesus and his words. That's a known fact. I believe Scripture is factual. That's the first encounter we have with something related to James. and through Mark, and through Matthew, we have the description of his own family being upset with him, obviously because of the message. Because of the message. They literally had no faith in Christ. They had no faith in her son, Mary, 
when of all people should have known that something wonderful is going to happen because look at the wonderful miracle that was given to her to participate in bringing the son of the living God be brought forth in flesh to deliver us from a miserable destiny from a miserable destiny in his own kin and his own house rejected him and include everyone everyone it's not by accident in two different gospel records that the list of the people in his family were included in that rejection so here we have James the first encounter we have with them in Mark and in Matthew and even though Luke does not give us the details of the kin thank God for the other gospels I think that's why you need to study all the gospel records when you're trying to do a parallel passage study of scripture in the gospels now James was an unbeliever his family was offended they were also non-faithing individuals in Christ at that point now you go to Matthew 12 let's just lay down the groundwork to see where James was back then and what he got delivered from and now how he followed Christ James 12, not James 12, excuse me, Matthew 12. Let's just go to verse 46. Let's just start with verse 46. While he yet talked to the people, who's he? Jesus. His mother, this is Mary now, and his brethren, this is his brother's, possibly sisters also, stood without, stood without, circle those words, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he, Jesus that is, answered and said unto him, that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? Who is my mother, who is my brothers and sisters? And he stretched forth his hands toward his disciples. And said, Behold my mother and my brethren. The ones that would not reject the message. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. James would come to the point where he would do the will of the Father which is in heaven. But at this point, even though he was a Nazarite, he was rejecting the message and the person of Jesus Christ. You'll also see the story in Mark chapter 3. I'm not going to go to all of them tonight. I don't have time. Starting with verse 31. You'll see Jesus' mothers and mother and brothers there also. There came his, then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multiple sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked around about on them which sat about him, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, forever shall do the will of God the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. And also in Luke 8, well, I might as well go to all of them, so we have a record of putting it down. In the series, Luke 8, verse 19 through 21. Then came to him his mother and his brethren and could not come at him for the press or literally the multitude, the crowd, the mob. And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. Not just professing faithers, but doers of the faith, as James would say later in chapter 1 in his epistle that hear the word of God and do it. Put it into action. Now, back to Matthew 12. Go to Matthew 12, verse 46. There's something very interesting about Jesus' family. In the, in the scripture in verse 46. 
Let me just read it to you. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without or stood outside, desiring to speak with him. Now, Luke said there was a crowd there, and because of the crowd, they couldn't get to him. Come on, folks. That was their excuse, I'm sure. Think about Mary, the mother of Jesus. If she would pronounce, remember, if she would pronounce to this crowd, that's my son. Can I get close to see him or hear him? You don't think there'd been an opening? Even the most unruly crowd probably would have a few members in it that would say, hey, let me make some space for you here. Let me give you an opening so you get through. What this scripture is pointing out their lack of desire to press in close. They were standing on the outside. His mother and brethren stood without. They were standing on the outside when they should have been standing within. And the reason why they were not standing within because as the other scripture I read to you a few moments ago, they were in a state of apistus. They didn't have no faith in Christ. They were not con converted followers of Jesus at this time. And that includes James. And that includes James. Go to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. As we march along here in the Gospels. Let's go to verse 1. Let's just start at verse 1. Now this is Jesus where he would eventually arrive at the Feast of Tabernacles. But his family approached him. Basically saying, why don't you travel with us or go with us to the, the city of Jerusalem to honor the Feast of the Tabernacles. James being a devout Nazarite, that was a requirement. After these things, James walked, not James, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry. In other words, he would stay away from the southern portions of the nation because the Jews sought to kill him. He was on the Jews' ten most wanted list. He was number one, I'm sure. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren, meaning his family, therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also must see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeth to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. They were sneering at him, folks. You might get the impression they were saying, oh, they're finally getting the message and they want people in the city of Jerusalem to also see not only the mighty works that Jesus was performing by healing people, delivering from demons, but also by hearing what he had to say. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into the Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret. Why are you hiding him from the rest of the nation? Especially the, the people in Jerusalem. That's a central seat of which our faith is based upon. Go there. It's almost like at this point they just wanted to get rid of Jesus. Knowing that if Jesus would go to the Jewry as he's described in verse 1. There might be a plot to get rid of them. And at this point, I'm not too sure that's not what they wanted to do also. I know that sounds harsh, but these scriptures are open to many interpretations. And the only record that we have at this point is his family, I believe especially his brothers, were not very pleased with them. His mother had doubts, and she should have pressed close. She should have been within instead of she was without. So his brothers and sisters, but that didn't happen. And that, at this point, I don't believe they were converted at this point yet. None of them. Maybe on the outside, Mary at this point. But nevertheless, now Mary would become converted, I believe, before his death. But the rest of the brothers didn't. 
For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Pisteo is the Greek word there. For neither did his brethren faith in him. They didn't trust him. They didn't believe his words. They didn't believe the message. They didn't believe why he was here. He, they didn't believe where he came from. He didn't, they didn't believe that he was Savior. But Jesus replied unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is already, always ready. Why is Jesus saying that? My time is not yet come, meaning that the time of my departure, what I have to do to save this world, is not yet upon me. But you could read into this, but your time is always ready. Your time of getting rid of me, you seem to be at the ready for it. There's no conversion that took place at this time. And there's some, not many, but there's some that believe that at this point the apostles, I mean the apostles, the brothers were converted. At least James was. No, he wasn't. He was still an unbeliever. And he tells him, go ye up to the feast, and I go not unto you to this feast, for my time is not yet full come. You go before me. And then Jesus finally would, would go, and he would go in secret. So most of the city didn't know he was even there. But here's another case in point where Jesus is rejected by his brethren, his own family. They rejected his claim to be the Messiah. And in John here in chapter 7, they were sneering at him. Jesus put, puts it straight into the point. They had no faith in him. He was just an annoyance. He was just a fanatic. He was drawing too much attention to himself and probably to the family. And Jesus told them point blank, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. No, no, no. My time for what the Jews have planned for me the fanatical religious Jews, is not yet. But your time is always ready. What time? Verse 1, because the Jews sought to kill him. I'm sorry. You could try to clean these scriptures up any way you can. You can massage them to make them look differently. But that's what the context is, and that's what's meant here. A total rejection of Jesus by his family. Now, something happens. Something happens. I believe Mary finally came to the conclusion who Jesus was. And she started worshiping him as Lord and Savior. Not just as a son, her son. A child from her womb. And she recognized before his death that's obvious, which I'm not going to get into in this, in this scripture study because we're trying to focus on James. But his brothers didn't. But something happened that's remarkable. If you go to Acts chapter 1, just before Jesus' departure, the ascension up into the blue that we have recorded here in Acts chapter 1 and the verses, and his promise that the the comforter would come. And of course, the disciples at that point were still wondering. That's why they were not candidates to lead the church of Jerusalem. They're still wondering when the restoration of the kingdom of Israel was going to take place. They were still looking at him as a Messiah in the flesh for flesh, fleshly reasons to be delivered from the bondage of rulers, earthly rulers. They didn't see him as a Messiah that delivered him from a spiritual unseen ruler that controls those earthly rulers. But they would come to that knowledge, and they would come to it quickly. But they were not candidates for that position of bishop. And they didn't have the necessary background to get the attention, especially of the religious world and the non-religious world, that was necessary because the way 
the nation of Israel and its population perceived and would get direction from because of the position the person held. Now you see that in Acts chapter 1. Let's just start with verse 13. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in a like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He's coming back. He didn't say when, but he said he's coming back, these witnesses. And so Jesus sailed on to the, into the blue, and they returned, as Jesus instructed. As Jesus instructed, they returned, they unto Jerusalem, according to the Gospel of Thomas, and instructed also by Jesus to go to James. They returned, they unto Jerusalem, for the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into the upper room, where abode both Peter and James, not the James that wrote the book of James, not James, Jesus' half-brother, but both Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and, the, and Simon, and Judas, the brother of James. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, Disciples. Obviously, Judas Iscariot was the one that betrayed Jesus. He was not part of that group. Eleven disciples. And they all continued, not just these eleven disciples, by the way, they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. With the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Whose brethren? Jesus' brethren, his brothers, and possibly sisters, and possibly sisters. They're not standing outside now looking in, but they're inside where they belong. They're inside in this upper room, praying and supplicating, along with their mother. And why? Well, I can understand maybe why Mary was there, because there's record in the Gospels of her transformation, especially as they got closer to Jesus' death. But his brothers, I can't understand why. I never understood why. And that's why I had to do a study on it. And it always brings me back to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 7 that he also appeared to James. Out of nowhere, now Jesus makes it a point to appear to James. Thank God for the verifiable historical record that we have that gives an account that even though after Jesus died and after the reports of the resurrection, James still wouldn't believe that he was alive. He had to see with his own eyes. And he did. And from that point on, he's a changed man. He's not outside looking any, any longer either. He's now in the inside where he belonged all along. He got there a little late, but he got there. He, along with the disciples and the rest of his brethren and his mother, were there praying and supplicating. From this point on, James becomes the bishop of the church of Jerusalem. That's obvious. You go to Galatians real quick. You go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 9. You'll see references of James. Galatians chapter 2, verse 9. You'll see, And when James, Cephas, Peter that is, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, Paul speaking of himself, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen they, unto the circumcision. They would stay in Jerusalem and deal with the Jews and Paul and Barnabas would go into Galatia and the rest of Asia Minor and even some Grecian areas at that time. And that's what they did. And that's what they did. James became the bishop of the church of Jerusalem, the mother church, 
And these apostles and disciples will go out and branch out and expand the church of God. You see it in Galatians 2.9, James, Peter, and John, pillars of the church. You see in Acts 12.17, I have preached on this. I believe it was the first message I ever preached in this ministry, how Paul delivered from prison and how the saints were praying. But yet, with all their prayers, when Peter was finally delivered from prison, remember, John, I mean, James, excuse me, another apostle, was beheaded. And Peter was next on the list to be exterminated because of the message that they were preaching. And Peter was delivered by an angel from prison and the angel gave him an instruction and the instruction you see in verse 17 but he beckoned unto them with a hand to hold their peace declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison and he said go show these things this is the instruction Peter got from the angel go show these things unto James and in this case and to the brethren not so much James brethren but the brethren in general and he departed and went to another place. So after he would give the report to James, meaning that James had a position in the church at this point in Acts, the record we have here of Acts, that Luke wrote, by the way, where Peter was given the assignment to go back to the praying saints and let James know what had happened. James know. Acknowledging the position that James had in the church. Amongst other things. You go to Acts 21. Acts 21. I believe it's verse 19. Oh, I'll just start with verse 17, which is where Paul arrives in Jerusalem. And when we come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. Over and over in Scripture, you have even Paul reporting back to James how their journey went, their missionary journey, what was established. How the Gentiles are converting over and now faithing in Christ Jesus as their, their Savior. Being delivered, been delivered the message of grace. And now set forth in a new journey that would lead them to an eternal life. That's the report over and over in Scripture. And of course, you have the record in Acts 15. And that will be my next message. These verses show that James had become the leader of the church of Jerusalem. There is no doubt. There is no doubt. But I wanted to lay down a record of where we see James in Scripture as an unbeliever and a believer. And because of that intervention by the Lord himself, after the resurrection, coming to James and showing James with his own eyes the resurrected half-brother, now Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. His direction would change from that point on. His commitment would change from that point on. His service to his Lord would change from that point on. And he was elected, I believe, there's only conclusion for it, because of James and his background and his access to areas that the other apostles and disciples didn't have outside of Paul, but Paul was not on the scene yet, was chosen. And because he was a hardhead, and he needed somebody eccentric and a hardhead to survive those early days, especially the attacks that church was under. And that's what happened. Jesus changed the man. 
by his appearance. He's doing that today in lives across this world every day. By his appearance through the word of God, the record we have here in the New Testament, there's lives changed. Lives that are miserable, horrendous, evil. But now Christ has directed them into a new path, leading on a journey of a lifetime that will give them eternal life. The same is happening today as it did for James. And it put James in a position of now a responsibility to make sure the Great Commission was going to be fulfilled. Yes, there'll be struggles. And yes, there'll be confrontations. And yes, there'll be debates on which direction the church should go. But you'll find out in my next message in Acts 15 that James got it right. That James got it right when push came to the shove. And that will be my next message. If you want me to continue on with this series, I want to hear from you while they play that song.